Welcome to In the News for July 30th, 2021. I am Brett Bernie from AbsonLaw.com. Hi, this is Jeff Richardson from iPhone JD. Jeff, why don't we start off with a public service announcement <laughs> this morning? I mean, it, well, actually, it's a good follow up from some of the things we were talking about last week, right? With right. the NSO software, the Pegasus software, which honestly, I don't think was a huge concern for the vast majority of quote regular people uh, out there. But it was a little scary in the sense of what it could do on your phone. But Apple, as per usual, although they're not explicitly saying this is why they released this little upgrade, but everybody kind of knows that uh, iOS 14.7.1 <laughs> was recently released. And that's what you started off your in the news post with, which is good. Yeah, I mean, every iPhone update, iPhone, iPad, Mac, you name it, Apple Watch update has a security component <laughs> yeah. to it. But right. every once in a while, Apple will say that they're patching a security component that they have evidence was actually being used out there in the wild. Right. Uh, you know, right. Was it being used by, you know, in one instance or in a million instances, we don't know. But this is a, you right. know, just a perfect example of how when an update comes out, go ahead and install it. And. Typically, we've talked about this a couple of times. Yeah, I, we know a lot of people that are hesitant to upgrade when when an update comes out. And if it's what I call like a, a, a tenth upgrade, like a 14.8 or 14.9, or certainly maybe even if it goes 14 to 15, sometimes if you want to wait a few days, that's fine. Let the guinea pigs do it. But in this case, as you can see, it's 14.7.1, right? Which means it's going to be mostly stable. There really is no good reason to not install this. Plus, it's just going to give you all those benefits of those uh, the, the, the extra security patches on there. Right. And you did a great job of Lincoln. I know John Simic for many, many years. He's got a great blog on this. And basically, it's, it, you know, he goes in and it's like it's the Apple devices that are vulnerable on there. But it, it, to me, it just doesn't matter <laughs> if you got an if you got an iPhone or an iPad or even an Apple Watch or even a Mac, really just go ahead and install sort of like this point a uh, point point uh, update the small update it's it's uh it's it's well worth it yeah it's and, funny because on that list that you yeah. had from john that was on the screen he listed like eight different apple devices and then right. after he wrote that post apple just yesterday updated the apple watch too and you know the risks of exactly. bad guys you yep. know targeting your apple watch right. who knows but you know might as well install it there too that, that one just came out yesterday and then just quickly, again, because of the follow-up what we were talking about last week, you had a good link on this too, that um, if anybody was concerned that maybe, you know, some nation state is following them and tracking all their information, uh, apparently there is a very simple way that you can prohibit this. It's simply uh, rebooting your phone or turning yeah. it off and turning it back on. <laughs> this one's interesting because the, the way that a lot of this malware works is they, you know, either you click a link in messages or on the internet or on your iPhone or something like that, but somehow the, the the bad, you know, malware gets on your device and it stays in memory running in the background, you right, know, right. capturing your pictures or whatever it's doing, listen, reading your messages. But if you restart, then in most cases it goes away. Now, when I linked last week to the Pegasus article, it actually had a way that it would sort of notice that it wasn't active or like a third, the third party right. server would notice it wasn't active and would try to reinstall it. But at least you're making it much harder for the bad guys. This advice is funny because for me, you know, my Mac at my home, I basically leave on all the time. My iPhone, right. my iPad, I, I never restart right. them. Whereas at my office, the PC that I use, I mean, I restart my PC, you know, regularly. Whenever I have a problem, you know, restart right. the computer is like the number one Rule fix number one. for it. Right. So um, I, I, and I've always thought of, you know, oh, how unfortunate that you get to restart PC so much, but now we have a reason to restart our iPhones and iPads too. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. again, it really only makes a difference if you got malware on there. Hopefully right. none of us do, right. but it right. requires so little effort to do a restart that when this advice is why not restart it once a week, you know, probably not bad yeah. advice. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, well, I just wanted to start that off because we talked about this. I know people were kind of asking some of the questions about that Pegasus software. So thank you for following up on that. So now we, now let's get to some maybe some more fun <laughs> topics. You got a great review of an app that I you've reviewed before, right? This is like your second time this writing about it. This is the second part. It? Yeah, okay. I, I, when I wrote the review of MyHeritage two weeks ago, oh, I talked yeah. about using it to create a family tree, which is, you know, a yeah, great you you know, are. product, stuff like that. But MyHeritage has this whole other feature that I didn't want to put in that first review because it's really a separate topic. It's using the software to um, 
to improve old photographs. And <laughs> right. uh, it's, it's interesting because my heritage recognizes that there's really two typical problems with old photographs. One of them is that the color fades over time. We've all seen that right. when you have a photo right. and you, and you scan it and then you got to adjust the picture. And sometimes they're in black and white. So they had no color in the first place. Um, right. But the other problem is that they're, they're they tend to be more blurry. I mean, the, the, the for most of our pictures were taken like with one of these little snap cameras, you know, 50 years ago or something <laughs> film, and, or right. a Polaroid and, right. and then you scan it. And so they're just not very clear. And so my heritage came up with sort of one button, you know, click one button ways to improve it. And I was actually impressed with how well it works. It's very it's really impressive. impressive. Yeah. yeah. The one that you're showing the, right now is these pictures. Of- I mean, first of all, you got to read this this post just because it's some incredibly cute pictures of Jeff as a baby, <laughs> but, but you did a great job. Not only do you talk about, you know, just, I think the practicality of it, but you dig a little bit into sort of how this is being done. It's like the AI technology. And then, you know, you even link down here to some of those videos. I know with the Tom Cruise actor, people haven't, to me, I'm still just mind boggled about that, but yeah. back, back to the, my heritage app, you do a great job here of just, I mean, you're right. If you if we get, if we look closely, some of these old photographs they do get a little blurry just because you know we didn't have megapixels back in the day of film. But it's it's amazing how good of a job it does. Plus, yeah. I mean, first of all, you look very cute. But second of all, I mean, it just really does a great job of sharpening that up to where it looks like it could be a picture that was taken today. Yeah, when I was looking for examples in this post, I mean, I've done this on many photos in my library, but I didn't really feel comfortable posting photos that were manipulated of other people that were my loved ones right, and stuff like that. Right. So I figured, why yeah, not yeah. put myself out there? So I got to <laughs> post silly pictures of me as a kid. But we'd say, but as you were just touching on, you know, this is not software saying, you know, looking at this particular picture, this is what I should do. But instead, right. it's artificial intelligence that they feed like thousands millions of pictures into the computer right, and the computer right. decides on its own here is what makes some pictures look better than other others and then tries to apply that same learning it's the computer learning it's the artificial learning right. to your own photographs and when it works um it works really really well um yes. but when it doesn't work it when can it actually doesn't. produce some pretty comical <laughs> results and you know this yeah. one right here that you've got it was a picture of me that when i tried to make the face clearer I, it, it looks much like a cartoon or something like that it just yeah. doesn't work because it's, it's like trying a little to robot make, yeah it's like part of the picture robot is or too sharp <laughs> and part of the picture is not so that's just not good yeah and i mean i guess if you look kind of you know stand back a little bit it looks okay but I got to tell you, that wasn't the one that really uh, bothered me <laughs> as much as the animated pictures that you saw. Where, here, you had just had links in here. Because <laughs> um, you talk about the fact that not only will it sharpen the face, but it will also animate uh, the faces. And th- 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 this is a nice video that, that you link to here that just kind of shows what's the possibility. But of course, I'm sure these videos were kind of <laughs> taken in sort of a, a, a lab environment, right? To where it looks yeah. really good. This it, it's, <laughs> it's a freaky You did effect. it on yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you take a still photograph and you try to add animation to it. And, you know, it really is this uncanny valley effect where it's so it's looks close crazy to real, right there. but because yeah. it's not quite real, it just feels wrong. Um, so I'm not right. sure I'm a huge fan right. of it. I will say this, however, that when you look at a picture that's been animated, it does sort of make you feel like you're a little closer. I mean, I've seen people right. post that, you know, they had a loved one that they lost 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and just, and they didn't have much video of that person, but just being able right. to see an animated version of the face felt, made them feel like they were closer to the person. Yeah. So I suppose yeah. there's some therapeutic you know, advantage there. It's also creepy though. So. I, <laughs> and that's it. I mean, and some of these pictures, I mean, you know, it's humans. I mean, our brain is so crazy that the computations that it does, like here's your video of you, which this first one that you did, I thought looked pretty good. You know, if you're not, if I didn't something know you. Something about the eyes <laughs> seems wrong to me. I don't you know, know, that's what I'm saying. Our brain can sense something that's just, you know, something tiny, teeny tiny is just off a little bit. Yeah. But to your point though, the fact that, you know, you may have seen these pictures, you know, hundreds and thousands of times in your life if they were something that was sitting on a, a mantle or something. And to just see just a, a slight tiny bit of an animation. Yeah, it, it does grab you somewhere a little bit, which is uh, which is really neat. Yeah. So that that's a great app, my my heritage, and obviously you you like it. You've been talking about it a couple of in it's a couple of articles. I mean, it's now. expensive too, but it's got a lot yeah. of features to it. So I mean, if you get into it, but you don't have to spend hundreds of dollars for my heritage. I mean, I didn't talk about this in the post, but if you want to improve your photos, and Brett, I'm sure you have things that you do too. You know, the the, yeah. the regular photos app 
on the iPhone or iPad or in the Mac yes. has some great features for, you know, improving photographs and adjusting the colors yeah. and, and, you know, fixing little blemishes. And I use it all the time. I also pay for Photoshop, which is an expensive product, yes. but Photoshop, yeah. or even if you use the less expensive Photoshop elements, it has just some amazing features for adjusting elements and stuff. And I've been using that stuff for years and it's, yeah. it's really good. And it works pretty well on the iPad too. Um, one of the ones that I'll mention, just speaking about iPad, is there's an app called Pixelmator Photo on the iPad. Yes. When we were talking about there artificial it intelligence. It has the same thing. Um, they call it um, ML, machine learning, instead of artificial intelligence, but I think it's right, all the same right. thing. Pretty and much. they will, you know, they <laughs> right. will, you can click a button and it will try to improve your photograph based upon their analysis of millions of other photographs. Or you can use the ML function for individual things. So, like, you want to adjust the wow. color, but before you start tweaking with it, go ahead and click on the ML and see what they do first. Right. And it might right. be perfect just like that. Or right. you can start from there and then adjust it. Um, so that's that's an app that, that, I, that I, I like a lot. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about this. And, and yeah. another one that I haven't, used much is called Lightroom. Is that is that Adobe as well? Or is yeah, that it's it also is Adobe. Okay. I, for some reason I've I've always used Photoshop just because I've I've Photoshop is what I've used for years and years and right. years. Right. Lightroom is more photo uh, centric, but the, the okay. essential tools are, are basically the the, the same. Um they yeah. really work well. Another yeah. one that I that it's speaking of the Photoshop universe, there's an app that I think is actually free called PS for like Photoshop, PS yep. Express. There it is. And yeah. it has little it's it's sort of like the simple it tries to take the power of Photoshop and give it that you can just click one button. And I'll give you one specific example that I use this app for on my iPad, which is, you know, sometimes you have a photo that's got red eye in it. Um, the yeah. Apple red eye tool on the Mac is okay, but not great. Yep. And as right, of now, right. I think they still don't even have wet red eye fixing on the iPhone iPad. So if I have a, a photo with a red eye, ah. I will load it into PS express. It's got the one touch thing. You just tap on the, you know, tap on the eye Boom. in the picture. It fixes it. It works well. I mean, literally 90% of the time that I use this particular app, I'm using it for that one feature. But it's got many other features, too, that can, um, you know, do, you know, do some manipulations and add stickers to things and even... Yeah. You know, make someone that, where their eyes are closed, make them look more open. I see that things like that. That's incredible. You know, and you get into, again, these sort of, I don't know if it's ethical or, you know, at what point <laughs> is manipulating a picture yeah. too much of changing what the truth is? I'll, I'll let the ethicist decide that, but you know, do what you want with your pictures. So um, right. it's, it's fun tools. Well, those are those those are great apps. And I hear people talking about that. In fact, I was just listening to another podcast where um, – well, it was Leo Laporte, and he had just come back from Hawaii, and he was talking about using his iPad. Like, all he took with him was his iPhone and his iPad. He may have had another camera, but he just used his iPad as a way to do exactly what you're describing, Jeff. You know, he was like, first of all, the pictures themselves on their own were pretty good, but he just brought them in to either Lightroom or I don't even know if he used Lightroom, maybe a couple of other apps that he was trying out on his iPad. But he's like just one tap and he could create something, you know, make it just look a little bit different, pop something just a little bit more of the colors. You don't have to really i mean it's just amazing how this technology has allowed the common man to be able just to improve the photos uh, a little bit yeah uh, one, off, one quick thing yeah. on that that idea of using your ipad because i heard i heard the same podcast you're talking about um and in fact when i've taken some big family trips where like you're gone for like a week or something and you're taking mm -hmm. tons of photographs um even if you're using a regular camera you can use the little dongle to import the pictures into your ipad right i would right. often find that like at night, every day of a trip, when you're just looking for something to wind down for 20 minutes, I will look through the pictures from the day because I'll take hundreds and hundreds of pictures and I know most of them I'm going to throw away. The <laughs> right. iPad is a great device for just triaging your pictures. Yeah, so when you took 10 different word. versions of your family, you know, in front of Niagara Falls, you can just, you know, very quickly figure out this is the one I want to keep. And yeah. even if you, when you wait till you get home to do other photo fixes, or you can do the photo fixes right there on your iPad, but even if you're using it for nothing more than just triaging, it's so right. nice that when that way, good, you know, during your trip, you see what pictures you're taking. And when you get home, instead of having a thousand pictures, you only right. have 200 pictures um, right. to work with. The ones that you really like, you know, that, right. that you, the good you ones like. Where everybody's got their eyes open and everything right. else. Yeah. Well, I'm going to throw one of the apps that I have just started using that's similar to the My Heritage app. Um, I've been recently moving my mother, and obviously that means we're going through a bunch of the, of the house, but it turns out I had like my baby book and we had some old photo albums, exactly what you're talking about, old, old photographs that were either faded, you know, they weren't kept very well. 
And what I liked about this app, and, and I've just started using it, and I'm, I'm probably going to end up paying for it. I think it's like 50 bucks for a couple of years or something like that. It's very similar to what you're describing with My Heritage. But what I loved about it is that, I don't know if they have a picture here, but you literally just can hold your iPhone over that page of your photo album. And, you know, like most people, this was like, you know, the precursor to like scrapbooks these days. But, you know, the photos are all over. I think my mom used like rubber cement, you know, to like <laughs> glue the, right. the photos down, that kind of a stuff. But it was just, it's an easy way to take a whole picture. And what this app will do is it'll, first and of all, I don't all, think you said the name the of it yet. It's called, it's called oh, Photo, photo, photo Mime. Mime. M-Y-M-E, yeah, M-Y-M-E, M-Y-M-E, Photo Mime. Yes, okay. thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Photo Mime. Photo Mime. Photo mine, M-Y-N-E dot com. Photo mine. I'll have the links in the in the show notes, of course, as well. Uh, but what just real quick, what I, what I loved about it is that, number one, when I take those pictures, even if they're in sort of the glue down format on a uh, on a photo album, it will separate the pictures, number one. So cool. I don't have to like individually take pictures on that. And then number two, it will enhance them exactly what you're talking about. And I don't need it all to be fancy. I mean, frankly, I just want to preserve those pictures as it were, right? Before they really, you know, go go completely rotten or something. And I just found that this app was great. I've been using the free version. They're going to push you hard to pay for it. But frankly, it, it was, it, it, to me, it was worth it to even pay for just a little bit so that I could just capture those pictures because it's not like those are going to go anywhere, right? And instead of like getting in and doing a flatbed scanner and all that kind of stuff, this is one of the options that I use. Photo mine. M-Y-N-E. This is really cool. I've never heard of this yeah. before. And, you know, to, to amplify something you just said, even if you don't spend the time to fix the pictures, just having old pictures in digital yes, form is so exactly. nice because especially if you can like add dates to and stuff because the memories feature on the iPhone or the iPad or the Mac, it will do a great job of just surfacing photos from time to time. Yes, and yes. if you know when you don't scan them, then they're just forever in an album that you're never going to look at. But once you scan them, the photos can be a part of your life again. And you might just be sitting there doing some work at your desk and you glance at your iPad screen and you see this cool picture of like a loved That's one from 50 times. years ago. And Absolutely. it's like, oh, this is, so you're, it's, you're, it's getting some value out of your pictures again. So I strongly encourage whatever software you use to do it, you know, get yeah. those old photos out of the books and into your digital devices and, and, and they have a whole new life to them. It's great. That's a great way to think about it. Hey, you had two more apps that I think you've mentioned this Metafo before. Just, We've mentioned just that one on the podcast before, yeah. yeah. It's, it, yeah. it edits the, the the metadata, like the date and the time and place. And when iOS 15 comes out this fall, I think that this app may be Sherlocked, as they say. This, it, this may be a built-in <laughs> right. feature that you don't need right. the external app. But for now, it works really well, Metafo. That's a good one. Another one that you uh, you linked to, which I like as well. And there's several of these out there, but this is called Anna, Annotable, Annotatable, mm-hmm. Annotable. <laughs> yeah, but that's it's a basically nice app. just yeah, a good way to put like a, a little circle or some uh, literally to annotate the picture. Right? Is that how you use it? Yeah, exactly. You put little line lines on it, put some text. If you just have a picture and um, you just want to you know jot something on top of it before you send it to somebody, it works. It works well. It's very simple yeah, to use. You can in fact you can easily use it on your iPhone too. We could just do a whole hour just on like photo apps. Oh, and again, so it's not like, you know, I, I'm no expert in photography or anything like that, but it's just great to have these, these, uh, these tools available there. So another thing that you commented on, you wrote, actually wrote, I think earlier this week, right? On Apple's 2021 fiscal third quarter. <laughs> Your the short version good, is they have all yeah. the money. That's, that's <laughs> the short version. All the money in the world. <laughs> It's at Apple, you know, but you're always good to cover this and, and you always do a good job, Jeff, because, you know, some, some of us probably like myself, speaking for myself, I usually get a little bored with all the numbers, but it's important to sort of highlight some of the things. Cause I do like to see generally how many iPhones, how well is that iPhone market doing? You know, what is Apple giving any kind of flags or anything? And I always do like to look at the iPad market as well, which is just continuing to be so impressive uh, on this. Every quarter when Apple announces their results, the analysts will ask all these technical questions about things like inventory levels and, you know, exchange rates and stuff (laughs) I could care less about. But, you know, out of the call, there's usually a couple of gems that just sort of gives you a sense of what, you know, where is Apple putting all of its attention and um, and what might be coming in the future. And so that's that's sort of what I try to, to, to look at in these articles. And I mean, one of the big things is that ever since the pandemic began, uh, you know, one yeah. year ago this time, when a lot of companies were struggling, Apple, because so many people were buying computers and iPhones, right. iPads in the pandemic, they made, you know, tons of money. And here we are a year later. And after having that record quarter a year ago, they're now like, what was it like? 
38% higher or 33% higher than a year Incredible. ago. I mean, they are just doing Incredible. so well. Um, but what's, you know, what's interesting is it's not just the products. I, I linked to something from a California attorney, David yeah. Sparks mentioned this too, yeah, that services is becoming such a big thing for Apple. So much yes. of the money is coming from all the services that they sell. David said that he was a little concerned that maybe it might cause Apple to take its eye away from the ball being the products that we know and love and, and yep. make Apple more interested in having people just sort of month after month, pay money after money. And I guess that's a possibility, but, but Apple services are actually pretty good too. So, I, so far I feel like I'm getting value out of them. Well, they're, they're, I, I guess I would say they're getting better, right? For those of us that have watched it over the years, there have been many, many multitude of complaints oh, sometimes agreed, about iCloud agreed. services and about, you know, like even David, I think he puts it in here, right? That we only still get five gigs by default in iCloud storage. I mean, come on. I mean, that's been something that people have been complaining about for a long time. I'm sure Apple has good reasons for doing that. Obviously, it makes people want to pay more to, to upgrade, such as what I have done. But, you know, there are people that have complained about this historically, but it is getting better. It's just Apple takes their sweet time about it is one way to kind of look at it. But he does mention the fact they are getting better. Even the iCloud Plus plus features that are coming later this year, right? And you and I have talked about the Apple One services quite a bit that continue to get better and just kind of like bundling all of these different things together too. Yeah, that's a good deal because if you're going to get a couple of the services, you can you can save money by getting it into a bundle and you can either spend 15 bucks to get 15 bucks a month to get Apple Music, Apple TV Plus, Apple Arcade, and then some additional iCloud storage. Yeah. And then you can add five bucks to share that with the five people, which is a great deal. And then if you also want to add Fitness Plus and Apple News and even more space, you can go up to the premier plan for 30 bucks a month. But um, it, wow, they're, they're nice buying. And, you know, I didn't link to it today, but I, I saw a report this week. Now, this is a third party report, so it may be completely wrong. But its estimate okay. was that Apple TV <laughs> Plus had 3% of the market, whereas um, I really? think Netflix was the highest with close well, to yeah. 50% of the market or something like that. But the, I, but the point is that there's room for growth there, right? People are always, you know, looking at how our company is going to continue Absolutely. to grow. Absolutely. When they're already so big, Apple TV Plus has got some great content. Ted Lasso is starting right now, and yeah. so you know, it's, it that doesn't. Tonight. It doesn't really cost Apple anything more to have a hundred people watch it versus five people watch it. So, like, as you get more important people to sign up for these services, it's just more profit for the company, more money yeah. that Apple can use to to buy other companies or develop, you know, more R and D into making better iPhones and artificial intelligence and everything else into the sun. So, um, so that's Another what I thought was I, interesting. Yeah. Another thing I hear that people talk about the Apple TV is unlike Amazon Prime, which most of us already have, or Netflix, Apple TV doesn't have a lot of, I guess they call it back catalog. Does that make sense? Right. In other words, while it's Netflix, you can go on, you know, they've got movies all the way back to the 80s, 70s, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like they have a huge back catalog, whereas Apple TV Plus, I don't think really has that. They're really focused on like newer content. And for me, I know 3% sounds like uh, so trivial, but the fact that it's 3% already with actually no back catalog, that's impressive. Because again, just like we see with almost everything else at Apple, the markets that Apple gets into, just like you said, there is room for growth and they will grow. It will continue to get more. Who knows? They might buy Disney or something. I heard somebody speculated about that. And you know, that's got an amazing back catalog on there and that would just be mm -hmm. incredible, but it would not surprise me if something like that happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good stuff there on that. Okay, so from Apple TV, it's almost, I, it, it, I, I for the last several weeks, we've been talking about the MagSafe, new MagSafe charger. I don't know if you have it, but you link to a great story that I think is just good to kind of <laughs> wrap that up, as it were. We, we talk about the fact that the MagSafe is not the only option out there. Another company, Anchor, makes a, a similar product. In fact, they were out at first, but this was a really good article, I thought, uh, 9 to 5 Mac where he's comparing the two and i think at the at the end uh spoiler alert he concludes um apple's magsafe charger is good but he wouldn't necessarily recommend it and i think the the reason was anchor is a little bit less expensive it does much of the same and why not you know go for something that's like it was i think it's like half the price right yeah, and we were looking, this is exactly what you and I were talking about a week or two ago yes, of right. we want to see people compare the Apple product to the other ones. And this article compares it to Anchor. Yes. There was another uh, link that I had today that there's a similar product made by Hyper. Um, and, you know, but the, the theme yeah, seems yeah. to be that the third-party products are about half as expensive 
and right. they often have a little bit more battery power. So with those two things, you're like, why yes. would anybody buy the Apple product? Of course, you get more value with the other ones. And the only argument on the Apple or the big argument on the Apple side is that it's just more integrated. You know, things like yes, the indicators exactly. on the screen, the things that Apple can, the special sauce that they can add because because they they control everything, you know, indicators on the screen, the seamless nature of how it works. Um, there's just a little bit more awkwardness with the third party batteries and the Apple right. experience is more seamless. So, you know, the yeah. question it's just for you, do you want to get like you know, the, the most bang for your buck, even if it's a little bit more inconvenient, or do you want something that's more polished and is just going to work without, you know, you have to worry about anything. And, right. you know, right. that, dichotomy is really often the Apple dichotomy. Do you want to pay a little bit more for more polish? Yeah. And, I, and I don't mean to imply a result because sometimes I use the third-party product and sometimes I use the Apple product. It just right. depends upon it. So, um, but it's nice to see that there's choices. There was one thing in here. I thought it was in this article here that I liked, or maybe it was another one because when the iPhone 12 came out, which is what you can use MagSafe with when we talk about this, but there's the iPhone 12 mini, the Small iPhone one. 12, right? Or 12 Pro, and then the oh, yeah. 12 Max. Yeah, or am the, I wrong? the Mini, okay. the 12, the 12 Pro, the 12 Pro Max, four models. Oh, there's four. Okay, okay, there, there, there's, there's, there's four on here. Yeah, here, here they are. So the iPhone 12 has the Mini, the iPhone 12 regular, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the iPhone 12 Pro, and then the iPhone 12 Max. Pro on, Max. On yeah. that. Pro Max. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm even confused on this. Okay, but the point that I was getting to here is... What most people, I've heard this from several people, that if you have the iPhone 12 mini, an external battery absolutely makes sense. In fact, I think he says here that it, it's not a matter of if you need one, it's a matter of which one you're going to get if you have the mini, right? Yeah, he says it right here on there. Uh, I have the iPhone 12 Pro, and I got to tell you, I'm still amazed that I can probably almost get through a day and a half, maybe two days, and I am a fairly heavy user of it and i don't find a significant thing i remember when i was driving you know several hours and i had the the maps on the whole time uh, that would drain your battery because i had the brightness turned up and everything right just like anything else but i just like the fact that if you do have one of the minis then that's maybe more of an issue or, or more of something you might want to consider as opposed exactly. to if you had the max which has a bigger battery on, on there as well agreed yeah very good all right uh, okay, a couple of other things, a couple of bonus things <laughs> that I just love to throw in. You did a good job on, uh, I, I call it Spatial Beatles, because you you linked to a great article from Rolling Stones. This is a really one, good article, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the producers, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, uh, Giles, or Giles, I don't know how to pronounce it, Martin, you know, this is the son of George Martin, who was the Beatles producer, right? And so <laughs> right. that's why that name's familiar. So his dad produced the Beatles, and, and this guy is, is like my age, but he's been around the Beatles his entire life. And he's done a whole bunch of things in the music industry, but yeah. he's also done a lot with the music catalog, with the Beatles catalog. He was responsible for, remember years ago when the Beatles had that show in Las Vegas called Love that sort of yes, took the, the Beatles I remember that. and made it you know, yeah. all around you in 3D. And then you know about a decade or so ago, the Beatles had had that that game that you could play it was like a, a guitar hero type thing you play the guitar playing the beatles i music. had it you know we had it has, kids loved has it taken, yeah he has taken the beatles catalog and moved it into the digital world so nobody knows more about you know working with the Beatles specifically, but he also knows so much about music. And this article, it's interesting if you're interested in the Beatles, but it's also interested because the Rolling Stone <laughs> right. guy is, is asking him about the process of creating spatial audio and what are the considerations. And right. you know, it, it, there's, I, I guess I hadn't even thought about all this stuff until I read this article. I'm like, yeah. And he's talking about how different, you know, you don't want to do something, gosh, it's, it's not that unlike the a photo manipulation we were talking about at the beginning of the today show that you know you mm. want something that adds but but you don't want something that makes it seem unrealistic and creepy and the same is true here if you do spatial audio wrong it can produce results that don't seem right but if you do it right then it's just subtle enough that it makes the the music more full and he does yeah. a fantastic job of describing how it works with atmos and everything else by the way this this guy martin he he uh, works for sonos which makes like the very high end speaker yes. so he yes. he really understands all of this stuff and so if you have any interest in spatial audio uh, at you know Dolby Atmos music um, or the Beatles uh, read this article it's not often that we get I get to talk about Rolling Stone on iPhone JD but this <laughs> no. is this is a great article really good it, it really is and I first when I saw it I'm like okay you know okay, that, that'll be interesting but it was fascinating first of all I just one a couple of things in here he's talking about similar to what you were just saying Jeff that they're gonna they they will re-record John's voice in studio too so that what you're hearing are the reflections of the room that he's singing in isn't that like, amazing yeah that that's incredible 
incredible the way he was doing. And then uh, uh, Giles, Giles, uh, he, he was he's very, very good at some of the analogies. I loved it. This was my favorite. I hear uh, when he's talking about the immersive feeling of listening to spatial audio. He says, I like the idea of a vinyl record melting and you're falling into it. <laughs> <laughs> there you that's go. beautiful i love that and then you had a, you had another uh a, a short little uh article from the wire cutter as well that talks about uh you know the spatial audio like it, it this both of these articles really helped me to get my head literally wrapped around it or maybe the music wrapped around my head like i, I better understood a little bit more what was going on and yeah uh, and, just, and in this article from, great. from the wire cutter brent butterworth makes the point and, and in fact martin makes the same point in the rolling stone article that you know spatial audio doesn't inherently make a song better, worse, or anything. Yep, it's all right. about how it's mixed and how it's produced. And he has some examples in here that, you know, some some things, it you know, the, the voice actually sounds, and everything sounds wrong in spatial audio. Um, but in some things, it makes a great difference. So, I mean, right, and again, right. this is like anything, you know, if something was recorded in mono and you were going to create a stereo version of it, you right. could very simplistically put everything on the left side, except for one thing on the right side. And although there actually are some Beatles stuff that do that, but, you know, normally that would not be <laughs> right. good. But um, so it's it's all just how it's put together. And it reminds me that, you know, we listen to a song and we're just listening to it, you know, whatever. But you forget that, you know, a lot of time and effort often goes into how it's going to sound, how it's going to be mixed. And, right. um, you know, a careful be, if, when you have people that are really good at their craft, they can just produce yeah. really incredible results. All right. Another bonus was the video that you linked to. I just I was so fascinated by this. It's a photographer in New York, I think, that's talking to a photographer from Finland, I believe, where she is. Yeah, so he's one of the Apple specialists. He's one of the people that works okay, for Apple okay. in, in New York, like that you might meet in the Apple store. And he is interviewing, it's a photographer from Finland who happens to live in London. And um, she's showing some of her techniques. You know, photographers Incredible. have these eyes. They just see things that we don't see. But she has some very practical tips for how to take photos at night. And even like using like a simple little plastic color filter in front of your iPhone can that was completely fascinating. change how a photo looks. Um, if For folks watching the video today, you can see behind uh, Brett's head right now, he's got one of these pictures <laughs> behind him. And it gives you, it's Ta-da. almost like it's, oh. yeah, it's almost like it's an it's a otherworldly from another planet type look. Uh, there you go. <laughs> and uh, it's it's cool stuff. So it's I, I, this is one of those videos that I started to watch it to see what it's about. And then the next thing you and know, eight, eight minutes have gone by and I've I watched the whole stop. thing. So Truly, truly. And, you know, sometimes I look at these, I'm like, okay, this isn't something I'm really going to be interested in. But it's already enhanced. Just just to have that thought in my mind of like, it, it, not, only, not only is it like holding that little film and she even uses like some Vaseline on the film and then he breathes in front of us. You know, that's all neat and intriguing. But at the end of it, toward the end, and they, they talk about how they use the photo app, apps, just like what you were talking about earlier, Jeff, to sort of change the colors a little bit or make, you know, a certain color pop or, you know, blur it a little bit. I mean, it's just how to do some very simple photo editing on there from professionals, which I just think is uh, is is amazing. Very cool stuff there. So thanks for linking to that. OK, in the know. Again, we're going back to the Apple Watch. It seems like we <laughs> typically have some some uh, tips that we like doing on the Apple Watch. But um, l- let me just set this one up real quick. I had the honor and pleasure of being on the Mac Power Users podcast uh, a few weeks ago with uh, Davis Barks and and Stephen Hackett. And one of the picks that I uh, mentioned for the Mac was a little tiny app called Hand Mirror, which is a free app. It's a down. All it does is that it puts a little hand mirror icon up in my menu and I can click on it to see what I look like before I jump onto a Zoom call or something like that. And David Spark, I thought David for sure would have known about it, but he was like, this is so cool. I usually open photo booth to do that. And I said, I know I usually do the same thing. So anyway, because of that, the developer of um, the developer of uh that hand mirror app tweeted out that he's been listening to Mac power users, I think since 2009 or something like that. And he was like, so happy that it got posted. but this website, by the way, is great. And I just had to mention him again. Here he is, Raphael Conde or Condi. Uh, you could just tell his, his work is amazing. And he's actually joined a company called Superlist, which apparently is going to be the successor to Wunderlist, which I like a lot. Microsoft bought that company and the founders have gone on to create Superlist, but he has some really nifty apps there's a hand mirror app that i was talking about and here's another interesting one if um 
If you have anybody in your life that is uh, currently breastfeeding, this is a nifty app that he developed for his partner that they had a baby. But here's my pick is <laughs> is one called Thwip, which I just have to tell you, this is such an, an, an awesome little app. I've been annoying my wife and my children with it all <laughs> for the last three days. But it's just a little app that has some sound effects. It's a free app you download on your Apple Watch, and <laughs> you can just uh, pop up any kind of of a sound effect at any time it's called thwip because if you if you go on this little and by the way i'm doing it right here on the website you can just tap on it but it has like a little spider-man thing and i I think he's got a video down here where here it is he puts it on and he puts the watch in his hand if you can see that and then he does like what we used to do as a kids he would hold it and try to like shoot a web (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> out of his wrist and it makes the sound effect on there so you've got like things like an air horn the cricket sound i wish i had this when i was in law school i would have just annoyed all of my uh, uh professors but you when got I an air you, horn yeah, yeah when i saw you put this on the list i'm like why would i ever want to uh make a spider-man sound that's a little silly and then i realized that you know with one tap i could suddenly do the you know a little rim shot exactly. like how nice that you can always create a rim shot from your wrist or of course the other one i can see using all the time is the sad exactly the sad Thank you. i mean that's i'm gonna definitely find some occasion to annoy my teenagers this weekend with this i just want to have never, it you know i had he, never heard of this app before I'm so i know glad you're i know it. i love it i love well it. i just had to put on this 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 designer he's he's so great his website is really fantastic and i just had to give him another shout out because it's really good and he does a few other things i think he has his own podcast as well so you also have a really nifty apple watch app as well jeff yeah, and there, I was inspired by your pick because yours was an example of, of course, you can. there's iPhone and computer apps that will make silly sounds, but just having something that's on your wrist so it's always with you, then suddenly it, it's, you know, the Apple Watch app becomes much more important than the yes. iPhone or iPad version, right? Yes. And so that's what got me thinking of, well, what's another app on my Apple Watch that's more useful because it's on the Apple Watch? And this is this is the one that I'm talking about. It's called this Swipe is great. Scorecard. Now, there is a Swipe Scoreboard. There is a swipe scoreboard app for the iPhone. And of course, when you download right. one, you get the other one. And it's 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 nice and it allows you to keep score of different games. Like there's you know one interface for a this football game or a soccer game. But I don't really use the iPhone one. I use the Apple Watch one. And right. when I would often use it is if I was watching my daughter playing soccer. There is no one's out there keeping the official score for 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 some of these games. And so right. I liked that on right. my watch. <laughs> I could have this app running and whenever somebody scores, you just tap on, you know, the left side. If, if, you know, one side scores and on right. the right side, if the other right. side scores and you can just keep track of the score throughout the game. And so that That's way, so great. You're, you know, 30 minutes in the game, well, wait, what is the score? Or you just glance at your watch and there it is. Um, right. So if right. you're in an environment where uh, nobody else is keeping great. the official score, it's not like a basketball game where you can look up and see it right. on the wall. Um, it's just a simple little app. I believe that you can use the the Apple Watch one for free. And even if you pay for the full yeah, version of the app, which again, I don't think the full version changes anything on the watch. I think the full version just gives you more options on the iPhone. It's it's a dollar. So, I mean, it's it's exactly. all intents and purposes. Come on. So, so if you're in a situation- Support where that developer. Score, um, it's a simple little app to be able to do this on your Apple Watch. Very cool. That's great. I love it. It, it, it just, you know, it, it's amazing to me just in, in doing this with you because I we went out to eat last night. I used the tip app on my, my watch. It's amazing how much I'm starting to use the Apple Watch and some of these other apps just a little bit more and referencing it, which is just great. It's just just been fantastic to see the growth in that as well. Great. Yeah, great even when I, when I saw you mention the Thwip app and I downloaded it, the, I, I downloaded it using the App Store on my Apple Watch. And I'm still blown away that there is an app store on the Apple Watch. That just seems like, how could this little bitty thing have an app store? And yet I just, I downloaded an app and it worked great. So that's great. That's great. Well, thanks, Jeff, as always, always great to talk with you. Thanks for your tips and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Brett. Bye-bye everybody.